Well, hello, everybody. Um, welcome back to the Neuroblastoma Parent Global Symposium. My name is Pepe Penelope from the UK, and I will be moderating as well as presenting in this session entitled The Impact of Chemotherapy on Hearing. This will be delivered by myself, previously consultant paediatric oncologist at Great Ormond Street Hospital in the United Kingdom. Christine Knight, who is a paediatric oncologist, professor of paediatrics at the Dawn Becker Children's Hospital in Portland, Oregon, in the United States. Philly Simpkin, a parent from London. And there will also be a video from Jess Verdi, another parent. Before we begin, I'd like to draw your attention to the chat function on the right of the screen where you can submit your questions. There's the option to do so anonymously if you choose. And questions will be addressed after the presentations have concluded. So we will now begin the session. Sit this way. Hi, Christy. Hi, Peppy. And I'm Christy Knight. I'm, as Peppy mentioned, I'm an audiologist in Portland, Oregon, and I'm just thrilled to be here to share some information about the really important topic of hearing loss caused by um, chemotherapy treatment with cisplatin and carboplatin. So we need my slides. Do I need to upload them? Okay, I'm going to try and upload my slides. Okay, here they are. Wonderful. So I'm going to present this together with Christy, different parts of these slides, and then we will have um, presentations by Philly and Jess. So Christy's going to start. Our goals for this session are to review the prevalence and impact of hearing loss from neuroblastoma treatment. We'll also review um, the importance of monitoring children's hearing during and after treatment and support, um, support methods that are available for children who develop hearing loss. And lastly, we'll discuss the challenge of providing hearing protection in high-risk neuroblastoma. We'll start by reviewing the mechanism behind cisplatin-induced hearing loss. So just to review, a um, quick review about the hearing pathway, our ears are, are basically sound collectors. Um, sound is vibration of air molecules, and our ears are designed to receive those vibrations through the air. Um, they enter the ear canal and move the eardrum, so the eardrum picks up the sound vibrations. There are three tiny bones that connect to the eardrum on one end, and on the other end it connects to the cochlea, and those tiny bones pick up the sound vibrations and actually enhance the vibrations, allowing us to hear sounds that are very soft. That third bone that is connected to the cochlea actually moves a um, window membrane. The cochlea contains fluids and that vibration moves those fluids and the fluid stimulates special sensory cells called inner hair cells and outer hair cells. Those are very special cells that are um, critical for our ability to hear and distinguish differences in sounds. Um, once the hair cells receive the stimulation, they um, release neurotransmitter and that stimulates the auditory nerve that carries the signal to the brain for processing. And this is just a cross section of the cochlea to show those um, sensory hair cells. Those are those little blue amoeba looking characters um, towards the bottom middle. And when cisplatin is um, circulated through the blood, it can enter the cochlear fluids. And then it's taken up by several different cells in the cochlea. And the hair cells are a particular target. Um, the cochlea is a very um, isolated system in the body, and it does not have a mechanism by which to clear cisplatin or carboplatin. So once platinum enters the inner ear, there's just not a way for the body to clear it. And it can, um, with 
each subsequent treatment that platinum accumulates in the inner ear. <clears throat> and then this is just a slide showing um, a hair cell and there's a complex chain of molecular reactions that occur when cisplatin enters the hair cell. Um, but to kind of summarize it simply, what happens is there is an overload of reactive oxygen species, um, a depletion of cochlear, or excuse me, a depletion of cellular antioxidants, and also um, increase in inflammatory processes. And all of these cause permanent damage to the hair cells so that they're no longer able to function normally. And we receive our lifetime supply of hair cells when we're born, um, and they do not have the ability to repair themselves or regenerate when they are damaged. And as a result of that damage, we lose our sensitivity to sounds. So I'm going to talk about the prevalence of cisplatin-induced hearing loss, which we um, abbreviate to CIHL. There are different risk factors for developing hearing loss when children are going through chemotherapy. And one of the important ones is actually the genetic predisposition that children may or may not have to getting hearing loss. And although there's been a lot of work on this over the last decades, we still do not have a situation where we can, at diagnosis, be clear who's going to have the most problem with developing hearing loss and who isn't. But work is ongoing in that area. We also know that other medications that children need while they're getting chemotherapy, like aminoglycosides, um, antibiotics, vancomycin, or loop diuretics like frisamide, also interfere and can exacerbate hearing loss. The hearing loss often occurs from cisplatin, which is a chemotherapy drug, it can also occur from high dose carboplatin, doesn't usually occur from standard dose cisplatin, carboplatin. Um, but we now know more recently that the addition of vincristin to treatment protocols alongside cisplatin increases the hearing loss. And something that's important is that we know that noise induces hearing loss. And it's important to try and remember, particularly for our teenage children, to educate them to help protect against too much noise, particularly if they've already developed a problem. So platinum induced hearing loss is different depending on whether a child is getting cisplatin or carboplatin. When platinum hearing loss occurs, it's bilateral, it's both ears, it's permanent, and unfortunately the cisplatin or carboplatin never leaves the ear, and so it progresses over time. If you like, it's a little bit like early aging of the ear. Children treated with cisplatin for high-risk neuroblastoma are more likely to get hearing loss, whereas children treated with standard dose carboplatin for low and intermediate risk neuroblastoma are unlikely to develop hearing loss. So high-risk neuroblastoma and hearing loss. The hearing loss is reported differently in different articles depending on how the hearing loss has been measured, and it can range from 8 in 100 or 8% to 82 in 100, 82% of children with high-risk neuroblastoma depending on the references that you read. What I think is important is it has been reported that if hearing loss is not detected early and addressed, it can be directly associated with developmental alterations with significant deterioration in global intellectual functions, reading, mathematics, speech and social skills. So one of the key take home messages I hope from today is that yes, it's alarming to discover that your child is developing hearing loss as they go through treatment. But it's important to remember that if you know about it and if you can start helping them as soon as possible, that this will help them get through life better. Christy. Christy, I can't hear you. I'm so sorry. We're going to next talk about the impact Acquired hearing loss. Okay. When cisplatin enters the cochlea, it um, enters the region that encodes high frequency sounds, and that's the reason that hearing loss first appears in the high frequency range. And most typically, 
um, children will develop hearing loss in the high frequencies or mid to high frequencies. And the impact of that is that it causes a loss of audibility for high frequency speech sounds. And that directly impacts the child's ability to access spoken language. Because children are learning language for the first time and because their processing and central nervous system aren't yet mature, they really require exceptional hearing across the entire speech frequency range for optimal language and social development. The image on the right is an audiogram. Whenever we test someone's hearing, we chart their hearing levels on a graph like this. The different frequencies are displayed across the top from low frequencies on the left to high frequencies on the right. And then loudness or intensity is displayed from top to bottom on the side, from very soft levels of sound at the top of the chart to very loud at the bottom. And you can see that there's this gray or blue shaded area um, that has letters displayed inside of it. And that just shows the average um, loudness and frequency of sounds that we use in speech. So for example, the J as in judge is a lower frequency sound compared to the S as in um, Sam or uh, caps, for example. So um, the red circles on this chart show um, end of treatment hearing levels for a child after um, neuroblastoma therapy. And the importance of this is that those sounds that are below the red circles that are louder than the red circles. So the red circles are where the child is just starting to hear sounds, how much volume they need before they just begin to hear that sound frequency. So the things that are below the circles are things that would be audible at about a three foot distance in a quiet room, while the things that are above those circles are things that the child would not be able to perceive um, in most of the time. And what's really interesting is that different languages use different speech sounds and speech sounds vary in their importance and how often they occur in different languages. And this is a really interesting figure, um, the compared phonology in seven different languages and the red boxes moved down a little bit. But what we wanted to highlight is that the English language in particular has a lot of emphasis on high frequency sounds to obtain meaning. Um, high frequency sounds occur very often. They're really important for understanding the message. Um, high frequencies are important in all languages, but English in particular really has a lot of high frequency sounds. The um, one thing to that's interesting as well is that vowel sounds tend to be lower frequency and they really provide most of the energy or loudness in, the, in our words and in our speech. In contrast, consonants provide only about 10% of the energy of speech, but they, are, they um, provide 90% of the information that we need to understand the message. So consonants are really important and when you start missing the consonants, speech becomes much more difficult to understand. Um, listening is much more effortful the brain is trying to fill in the gaps when speech frequencies aren't heard. High frequency hearing is also really important to our ability to understand speech and noise. We rely on our high frequencies when the background noise is present or when we're in a situation where there's multiple people talking at the same time. High frequencies are also important for distant speech. The further we are in distance, from the thing that we're trying to listen to or the person we're trying to listen to, the softer all of the speech sounds will be. And distance hearing is really important for children because as they're developing language, they learn a lot of new words as well as learning about culture and social interactions with other people. A lot of that they learn through overhearing. Um, so they incidentally overhear the conversations of other people. And that provides them with a lot of language experience that's really important. Um, for, that, for children to have those opportunities, they have to be able to hear not only what's pretty close to them and one-on-one -on -one communication, but also hearing speech from a distance. And as a child develops hearing loss or when a child has hearing loss, their distance hearing is significantly reduced and they don't have as many opportunities for overhearing. And I'd lastly want to point out that high frequency hearing loss might be hard to observe in a young child because they're they can hear those vowel sounds they're going to respond when spoken to, and it should be harder to tell um, if they haven't exactly understood the message. Until that child gets older, it becomes a little bit more clear as their language develops and they have the ability to ask us to repeat what was said or I didn't understand what you said. 
So I wanted to share with you a meeting which impacted me hugely. I was invited in 2018 to a patient-focused drug development meeting. It was one of the first that had ever been held. It was organized by patient advocacy groups, so groups just like the one that's organized this seminar. And it's to help regulators understand the burden, in this instance, of platinum-induced hearing loss to explore the benefits and risks as expressed by patients and their caregivers. And it was presented to a panel from the FDA and I was invited to be there as well. Over 30 long-term survivors who've been treated for multiple cancers were present. And what came out of this meeting was that there was agreement that hearing loss had a profound impact on their ability to live normal social lives. They frequently felt lonely, depressed, they had lack of job opportunities, and some expressed the fact that they felt they were a burden on others. Several mothers requested that regulators put choices back in the hands of patients and of carers. I was very impacted by Tyler. He was an 18 year old and he said, I'm alive, but I don't feel alive because I feel alone and isolated in this quiet road that I live on. The bottom line, he went on, is I miss out on over 50% of what is said to me at any given point, television, phone, conversation, any of that. I feel left out and isolated, which makes me feel like I'm not part of this world. I'm sad about that. He went on, before my hearing loss, I was a happy, active, extroverted child. Now I'm too exhausted or anxious to enjoy new environments or activity. I'm lonely and typically anxious. I'm a different person because of my hearing loss. And he then said, I've told my parents many times that I wish I didn't go through my cancer treatment because of my hearing loss. It makes life difficult and unbearable. Jason's mum shared that when he was two and a half, she knew he couldn't hear. It was 10 months into cancer treatment and he was watching television. And she thought at first he was distracted, but he was looking right at her and his face was all scrunched up, but his eyes were wide. He was trying to understand her, but he couldn't. And he did this over and over again when very young, well before he learned to read lips. And she said, I will never forget that look. She went on to say wearing hearing aids is awful for Jason. From the very beginning, his ears hurt, he had headaches all the time and couldn't express how uncomfortable he really was. He was edgy and jumpy. Even with the best hearing aid technology, he still had to work so hard to hear. As a young kid, she said Jason was very outgoing, social, fearless and funny. But as he got older, his nature changed. He became shy afraid to make mistakes in school as well as with peers. He didn't participate in class. It was frustrating for him and for me as mum to see how his communication with hearing loss could become ugly. I just want to share this uh, summary of an article that came out in 2015 from the St. Jude's Lifetime Cohort Study. And this is their cohort of patients who did not have brain tumors because children with brain tumors do sometimes get cranial irradiation and that can cause other problems to development and IQ. But these children had had no brain irradiation, but 39% of them were not living independently. That means 39 out of 100. 45% or 45 out of 100 had never married and 34 out of 100 had not graduated high school or were unemployed. What does this mean compared to other survivors without a hearing loss? The OR stands for an odds ratio, but basically you take that number, it means 2.19 times children who had hearing loss were not living independently. 1.6 times children had never been married and 1.85 of children had a serious hearing loss, which was associated with a twofold increase of odds not graduating from high school or being unemployed. So those are really quite dramatic figures. I'll next talk about measuring hearing and monitoring hearing during treatment. 
So um, because the risk for cisplatin-induced hearing loss is high, it's important that children have hearing monitoring during treatment. And the primary importance is to determine if the child is hearing, if the child's hearing is changing, and to inform that child's family and caregivers and the medical treatment team that that's occurring. Um, there are different methods that are used to assess hearing for children at different ages. And that all is based on their development and what um, children are able to do at different stages. Some of our test methods are behavioral where um, we rely on the child to provide a response, for example, putting a, a toy in a container or providing a head turn toward a toy that lights up. There are other tests that are objective which measure the structure and function of the auditory system. There is a method that can assess child, children's hearing at any age. And ideally that would occur at diagnosis to get a baseline evaluation to compare back to later on. Um, would also recommend monitoring during treatment and at the end of treatment. And in addition to that, long-term follow-up um, after treatment is completed because there's a chance that hearing loss can worsen over time. When children are enrolled in clinical treatment trials, there's a lot of data points that we obtain from the hearing evaluations. And there was a system needed to capture all of that data into a single number to describe whether that child experienced hearing loss and how much. So the audiograms are graded, given a numeric grade from zero to four, um, so that the impact of treatment can be compared based on different treatment regimens and different ages of children. And that reason for that is so that improvements can be made over time um, to hopefully make treatment less likely to cause hearing loss or potentially add a protectant to pre preserve hearing. In those clinical trials, there is usually an audiologist or team of audiologists that are reviewing all of the um, hearing results to do the grading centrally. Um, and once the results are obtained centrally, then any grading system can be applied. And this is just an image to show um, audiologic results obtained. Again, an example of um, image in the center shows baseline hearing levels for a child. Um, if I were to draw a line at 15, so 15 decibels from the, um, from the top, that's typical hearing for children. And so this baseline audiogram shows completely normal hearing. And the end of treatment evaluation six, month later, six months later does show hearing loss in the mid to high frequency range. And so Dr. Brock and her colleagues developed a classification system that we could use to describe cisplatin-induced hearing loss, um, specifically for clinical cancer treatment trials. And the grading system was based on analyzing hearing outcomes from children treated with cisplatin. It uses a grade, grading system of grades 0 to 4 to describe um, no hearing loss or minimal hearing loss being grade 0 to severe hearing loss being grade 4. And the different numbers describe the frequency range at which hearing levels are 40 decibels or greater. And those um, grades to correspond to a loss of fre speech frequency information. So the higher the grade, the more um, severe the hearing loss and the less the child has access to those high frequency speech sounds. And the sample sentence below shows that something like the cat sound on the mat becomes a series of vowel sounds because you lose all of those um, consonant sounds. And we'd like to now mention how ways that children who acquire hearing loss can be supported. Um, really important to identify changes in hearing early so that intervention can be provided early. And as I mentioned, that includes age-appropriate monitoring during treatment and regular follow-up after treatment. Intervention can be provided as soon as hearing loss is identified. That includes um, education for the child, the family, their carers, teachers in the community about the implications of hearing loss and strategies that can be used to make communication easier. As Peppy mentioned earlier, really important that children be protected from additional noise exposure. As this platen remains in the inner ear, um, any additional noise exposure later on in life can, can be more impactful and is just um, good practice to keep in mind for, for everyone. So treatment recommendations are very individualized and that depends on the age of the child, their language development, how much hearing loss occurred, um, their school setting. 
lots of different factors that are taken into account, but some of the um, options can be hearing technologies. Digital hearing aids is a really important intervention to restore audibility so that the child is able to um, hear more sounds with the hearing aids on than they can without. In the case of a severe to profound hearing loss, cochlear implants are very helpful. There's also um, recommendations for speech and language support, facilitation of lip or speech reading so that that child can use visual cues in addition to what they are hearing, and sign language. And there are many strategies for school because the school environment tends to be more challenging. There's noise, it tends to be more noisy. There are different people talking from different locations in the room and the teacher may be continually moving around the room as they're presenting their lessons. Um, so really important that children have priority seating so that they're closer to the person speaking, allowing them to change locations so that they're best able to see and hear the person talking is ideal. Um, there are remote microphone systems that can stream a signal from a microphone worn by the person speaking um, through FM radio waves or infrared, and that signal can be delivered directly to that child's hearing devices, or the child could wear a um, in-the-ear receiver or speakers can be placed around the classroom. And the importance of that is it elevates the teacher's voice or the speaker's voice above the background noise, and it eliminates distance as a factor because the microphone is about six inches from the speaker's mouth. And so no matter where the speaker is in the room, it sounds like they're within six inches of that student. So that's a really important intervention. Closed captioning for video, and that's also an important intervention for home. Um, there may be um, additional educational supports needed. And one last thing to mention is that it's difficult to listen and process what we're hearing, be able to use speech reading cues and take notes at the same time. So maybe another student in the classroom could be a, could copy their notes for the student with hearing loss so that they're not required to take notes and try to process the lesson simultaneously. And these last communication strategies are simple things that can be done in any setting with anyone that has hearing difficulty. As I mentioned, distance is challenging, so moving closer, a distance of three to five feet is often best. As much as possible, reduce any background noise. So if people are talking in the hallway, close the door, close windows, get away from um, noisy equipment in the classroom, or a, maybe a, the student that tends to fidget or make noise, better to put um, the student with hearing loss in a different location in the classroom. Gain attention first before speaking. Using clear speech just means saying each word accurately and clearly pausing between phrases and thoughts, and using a moderate range of speech. I think when we're in comfortable settings, we tend to get a little bit lazy with communication. So just being att paying attention to how we're communicating is really helpful. Communicating face-to-face -face so that we're not turning away in the middle of a sentence or trying to um, do another task while we're having a conversation and checking for understanding. And in group settings, as much as possible, try to avoid speaking over each other. Important at dinner time that, you know, allow everybody to have a turn and try not to talk over the top of each other. So I'm going to come on to talking about protection from hearing loss. What can we do to try and reduce cisplatin hearing loss? We've been using cisplatin since the late 1980s, and we've known about the hearing loss since that time. Well, of course, we thought for many years that we just wouldn't use cisplatin anymore. It happens to be one of the most important drugs and is considered an essential drug by the World Health Organization. So that has not happened. We haven't managed to produce other drugs that totally replace cisplatin. What we have tried to do is reduce the cisplatin dose where possible, and there are clinical trials ongoing at the moment where we try to balance the risk alongside um, the amount of cisplatin that a child really needs. There's also the possibility of replacing cisplatin with less ototoxic platinum agents like carboplatin. And initially we thought that all cisplatin could be replaced by carboplatin. Unfortunately, carboplatin is not identical to cisplatin in how it works and what it does to the tumor. But in neuroblastoma, it is great that in low and intermediate risk disease, we have been able to replace cisplatin with carboplatin but it is still an essential drug for high-risk neuroblastoma.
So what is the next possibility? And this is what I got into together with Christy um, and others, is to explore the mechanisms of cisplatinototoxicity, try and find something that'll target the pathways working academically, but as well as with pharmaceutical companies and regulatory authorities. This is a picture of Ed Newald. It's one of my favorite pictures of him. And Christy has worked with him for many, many years. He is from Portland, Oregon. And it's thanks to Christy that I met Ed. She discovered my grading system back in 2005. And Ed rang me up and said, are you Dr. Brock from the Brock Grading? And invited me over to Portland. And that was how our relationship started and how I discovered at that time, so that's 2005, 20 years of NIH funded research that he was doing with his teams in Portland, Oregon. And that was where we got the ideas to try and bring this across and use it in children. Don't worry about this complicated graphic, but all I want to show you is that when I was there at Portland, Oregon, looking at these results that they were talking to me about, sodium thiosulfate was a drug which they were able to show in brain tumors and with special blood brain barrier disruption, which means that they give the drug intra arterially and then they give the sodium thiosulfate intravenously. So they have a, what we call two compartment model. But what you can see from this is the hearing loss is on the left and it increases as you go up on the left hand side and the number of treatment cycles is along the bottom. And I think you can see with the red blocks that in historical patients who got no sodium thiosulfate, their hearing loss just increased as they got more and more cycles of carboplatin. What fascinated me about this study was that you would have thought you needed to give STS at the same time as cisplatin to protect the hearing. But what Ed's team found was that actually the blue bars are if you give STS two hours after the carboplatin. And fascinatingly, the yellow bars are if you give STS four hours after carboplatin, i.e. much less hearing loss if you give the STS four hours after the carboplatin. And this study was what decided me to try and look into how can we give this to children separated by time. If you were to give both drugs intravenously, which you need to do, if a child has neuroblastoma, you need to be able to separate it by time so it does not prevent the cisplatin from working on the tumor. So I went back and discovered what had been going on elsewhere. In Germany, they'd done a wonderful study looking at what we call the pharmacokinetics of cisplatin use in pediatric patients. Basically, pharmacokinetics is looking at the amount of drug that is in a fluid. So the top graph A on the right is plasma, that's in the blood. The middle graph is what's in the urine and the bottom graph is also the cumulative amount in the urine. What this shows, giving an infusion of cisplatin, and I chose the particular graphs of an infusion of six hours, because if you give cisplatin over six hours, you can see in the top graph A that the amount of cisplatin in the blood goes up. And then you stop the infusion and actually it comes back down really, really quickly. By 12 hours, it's gone. And if you look in the urine, that's graph D, it starts appearing in the urine very fast. So it goes through the kidney really quickly and it accumulates in the urine. So what this told me was, but actually, if you could give the cisplatin over six hours, you could be pretty confident that six hours later, there was no cisplatin around in the blood and the STS wouldn't interfere with it. Now, Ed had a great friend, Pat Reynolds in Texas, and he asked Pat to do a test with neuroblastoma in a mouse model. Now, I can imagine that some of you are very disturbed perhaps by mouse modeling in medicine. But let me tell you that anybody who uses mice or rats or any animals in the laboratory have to pass very stringent tests on animal husbandry. And these mice are treated very well. 
and they are sacrificed in the kindest possible way. They put a neuroblastoma tumor sample taken from a child and they put it in the back of the neck where the skin is very floppy. So if it grows, it doesn't cause discomfort to the mouse. And if you look at the middle graph, you can see on the left, there's tumor volume. The black line is showing over days along the bottom how this tumor grows in the neck of the mouse and it can be measured with its a volume in the back of the neck. The um, green line at the bottom shows how cisplatin, when given time zero, can block that tumour growth and really suppress that tumour growth for about 20 days. Now what we asked Pat Reynolds to look at was what if you give STS alongside the cisplatin or delayed, what happens? Now, this is just one example. Of course, they did all the time points. But if you give STS at time zero, it is as if you're not giving any cisplatin. That blue line shows cisplatin and STS time zero. It grows as if it was getting no treatment. However, you give the STS six hours later, that's the red line, and it's as if you're giving cisplatin on its own. So this was a really important sort of proof of principle to us that if you separated STS by time, you would not interfere with the tumor activity of cisplatin that was killing the tumor, but you could perhaps protect the hearing. And I was very involved at the time with the Siopel group, very similar to Siopen, only this particular group works with children with liver cancer, and they ran clinical trials for children with liver cancer. And in this particular group, because liver cancer is very rare, we work with countries right across the world. And all of these countries have been involved in liver tumor studies. The liver tumor studies from Sarpel were all run from the UK, initially out of Leicester, and then out of the Clinical Trials Center in Birmingham. And what we managed to do with this information from Ed Newalton from Portland about STS was we managed to design a study where we were looking at children who had a very, very good outcome. They had standard risk localized hepatoblastoma, that's the primary liver cancer in children. They'd been receiving six cycles of cisplatin for their treatment, four cycles initially, then surgery to reset the tumor, and then two more cycles of cisplatin. And we managed to design a trial where we'd simply randomize, half would get sodium thiosulfate and half would not get sodium thiosulfate. And we would compare the outcomes and we would compare the hearing. And this trial opened just before Christmas in 2007 at Great Ormond Street, and it closed in December 2014, after 52 other centers had joined and 12 countries worldwide had joined us. And in order to show whether or not we had helped the hearing, we compared the Brock grading of grade one or more with those that got cisplatin alone and those that got cisplatin plus STS. So this was a randomized phase three clinical trial. Cisplatin was given over six hours at 80 milligrams per meter squared. There was a six hour pause and then sodium thiosulfate was given over 15 minutes. In order to design this trial, we had to reduce the timing of the cisplatin, which was always given over 48 hours to six hours. And everybody agreed that that was a reasonable thing to do. There is actually no evidence that giving cisplatin over a longer time is better for the tumor than over a shorter time. And so these are the hearing results. You can see patients with a hearing loss on the left. So 63 out of 100, 63% of children that got cisplatin alone got a hearing loss of Brock grade one or more. Whereas those that got sodium thiosulfate, 33% or 33 out of 100 got a hearing loss, which meant that we considerably reduced the hearing loss caused by cisplatin by giving sodium thiosulfate. This is a, the same study 
but this is by grade. So the grade is along the bottom. Cisplatin alone, grade naught is normal or minimal hearing. Those that got cisplatin plus sodium thiosulfate, there were 67% with normal hearing. And then there were a few children with grade one, two, or three, but fewer children with grade one, two, or three than if they got cisplatin alone. And what is important is that even if you can't keep the hearing completely normal, if you can reduce the severity of it, that in itself will help the child. We looked at the survival and the survival, the overall survival of these children came out at 98%. So the survival was just as good with six hours of cisplatin, with cisplatin alone, and it was equal between the two arms of the study. So we were able to publish this in 2018 in the New England Journal of Medicine, showing that the addition of sodium thiosulfate administered six hours after cisplatin chemotherapy resulted in a lower incidence of cisplatin-induced hearing loss among children with standard risk heptoblastoma without jeopardizing overall or event-free survival. So this was a study which was used to go on to get this drug licensed or given marketing authorization. It got marketing authorization in the States, the bottom line in September 2022 last year and it got licensed by the EMA in June this year and in the UK by the MHRA on the 10th of October, so this year. So this drug is now licensed to be able to be used, but because the SAPEL study was done in children with standard risk disease and localized disease, it has been licensed for children with localized disease. And so Chris is going to explain the challenge that that leaves us with for neuroblastoma. So before STS hearing protection could be introduced into high-risk neuroblastoma, there's a real need for STS studies in metastatic disease and in high-risk disease. Um, there's just isn't the information yet um, to answer that question. We also wanted to highlight the importance of informing parents and children and their caregivers about the risk for hearing loss as part of informed consent. Um, that's just, a, families have to consent to many different things and be aware of, be informed about all the side effects of cancer therapy. In terms of hearing loss, um, important to know that cisplatin is a direct side effect. It occurs during treatment. It's bilateral and permanent. It starts with the high frequency sounds and progresses to lower frequencies as treatment continues. It's important to have a discussion that treatment changes may or may not be justified if hearing loss develops. And a lot of that um, consideration depends on the child's particular situation, um, the type of cancer they have and the stage of disease. And it's also dependent on the treatment protocol the child is treated under. And just critical to include parents and patients and caregivers in the risk benefit discussion on any intervention, including hearing protection. And that includes all treatment decisions during treatment, any discussion about potential upfront prevention, what the current studies have, uh, what we know based on the current studies and what we still don't know. And really important to include patient advocates as new clinical trials are developed and designed so that the um, family and patient voice is included. And just wanted to highlight um, a paper authored by Dr. Brock that was published in Pediatric Blood and Cancer last year um, that is a guideline for clinicians and kind of debating these challenges now um, where the results are, are pretty clear in localized disease, but there's more work to be done to find some protective strategies for high-risk disease. And we'd like to conclude by stating that not all children treated for, hip, for, excuse me, for neuroblastoma will develop hearing loss, but they are at risk. So it's really important that children are monitored during treatment and long-term follow-up is important due to possible progression or changes in hearing over time. Understanding high frequency hearing loss and supporting children at home and at school makes a huge difference in how they manage in their adult life. I want to just thank all of you in the audience for listening and just want to acknowledge all of the different 
with all of the families, the different professionals and centers that contributed to these studies, and all of the people that did the um, initial work at Dr. Newalt's lab to SciPen and SciPel, um, the two professional organizations that developed the clinical trial, and really want to acknowledge Supporting Kids Cancer for organizing this really important parent symposium. Thank you, Christy. Right, we are going to go on to um, introduce uh, two parents, Philly, who's going to be with us um, in live, and dear Jess, who's given us a video to show you. And we're also going to present three short YouTube videos that we produced alongside parents and particularly with Philly. So I would like to get Philly on if that's possible. Um, here she is. Hi, Hello. Philly. Sorry, it's a bit so dark much. here, isn't it? It is a bit dark. Thank you so much for joining us. It's lovely to see you. So, Philly, I'm going to ask you to introduce the first video. We're going to start with the nursery video, OK? Great. Um, hello, everybody. It's very nice to see you. Thank you for having me this afternoon. Um, these videos were created by a group of us. Uh, actually having experienced many of the things that have been discussed in this last uh, presentation from uh, Dr. Brock. Um, I will, after these videos, I'll chat to you a little bit more about my personal story with Ollie, our son. Uh, but uh, in the meantime, uh, this is the nursery video. A lot of these uh, experiences and things that you're going to see in these videos are uh, taken from real life experience, from Ollie's experience, uh, and are designed to help caregivers uh, particularly parents as your children go into school at various different stages to have something to give to teachers to say uh, I can explain to you why my child has hearing loss but this is what it feels like for them uh, and so we try to do it from uh, their perspective from the child's perspective uh, but informing uh, caregivers teachers head teachers SEN coordinators all of that kind of thing uh, about uh, what it looks like from the child's perspective so let's play the first video this is the uh, nursery video it is aimed for preschool uh, nursery type environments uh, yeah great could we play the first one please thank you Some cancer treatments can cause different levels of hearing loss. We hope to give you a better understanding of the impact of these on children and some of the ideas for you to help them. The effects of hearing loss can result in delayed development of communication skills, problems with learning and behavioural difficulties. Children. Children may not hear consonants and will find instructions easier if they can see your lips. Just speaking louder doesn't help. It's time to sit on the mat. They won't always know how to help themselves or in what situation they find it difficult to hear. Like a room with lots of background noise. An outside playground with lots of other noisy children. Or when you're talking with your back to them, you can help by bending down and repeating the instructions in their line of sight to check that they have understood and creating an environment where it is normal for you to do this. When you get to the top of the slide, make sure you sit down. Well, hopefully uh, you found that helpful. Um, there are two other videos which we're going to show you as well. There's one aimed at primary school age group and there's one at, aimed at secondary school as well. Um, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about our story and uh, what uh, kind of prompted us really to create these videos. Um, so I am mum to Ollie, 
sorry, I still get emotional talking about this. Oh. I'm mum to Ollie, who is now 17. Uh, he was diagnosed with a hepatoblastoma at six months old. So uh, he was diagnosed in November 2006. So those of you who are eager eyed on Pe Pepe's last few slides will realize that unfortunately he just missed out on the clinical trials for the STS drug. So Ollie had a hepatoblastoma, so he had liver cancer, and he received eight rounds of chemotherapy. So he had six rounds, which included cisplatin. Uh, he had surgery to remove the tumor, and then he had two rounds of carboplatin. Uh, so he, uh, through the course of his treatment, uh, was diagnosed with Brock grade one ototoxicity. So that is the very high frequency uh, hearing loss that we've been discussing and that you've seen in the diagrams uh, already presented this afternoon. Uh, it's uh, like, like many parents and like uh, you're going to see a video in a moment from a mum called Jess. Uh, I think I would echo her feelings that when your child is diagnosed with any kind of cancer, um, your first and kind of major uh, focus really is on getting your child well again and uh, so whatever is necessary to combat the disease. We were told very clearly that uh, we would, uh, hearing loss was was uh, pretty uh, common for cisplatin and that Ollie may well experience some kind of hearing loss. But to be brutally honest, at the time, I don't think we really understood what that meant, particularly because he was six months old. He wasn't talking he was just a baby. Um, it, it, the sort of future impact really uh, was something that we uh, kind of recognised but didn't really appreciate or understand. Um, so I think I think that is something to uh, to really think about, and to um, it's something that that I keep kind of coming back to actually. Um, that uh, yeah, those the, those initial conversations. It is hard, isn't it, as a parent to take everything on board. Um, as Ollie went uh, through uh, pr uh, nursery and primary school, um, he uh, we, we didn't really have that much support. Um, so he uh, continued to have audiology appointments every six months. We were told that uh, he he hearing aids probably wouldn't help him um, because he had Brock grade one. Um, it would uh, the issues really that he was he was facing were around background noise. Um, and uh, in a noisy classroom, not hearing the instructions. So again, a lot of what we've heard about in presentations uh, today um, was, was relevant to Ollie. Um, he, uh, we worked very closely with his primary school. He was in a, a nice small primary school. We were encouraged by the audiologist to send him to a school uh, where there were small classrooms, where it wasn't a kind of overwhelming for him. Uh, we talked to teachers about making sure that he sat at the front um, and uh, really we kind of uh, worked things out as we went along um, so and as obviously Ollie grew up he became more aware and was able to put his hands up say he didn't hear things say he didn't understand things and um, there are one or two times where um, things got tricky for him so there was one time where uh, he was told off uh, and kind of reprimanded for talking on the stairs uh, in school. That was because he hadn't heard the instruction uh, not to speak. Um, and particularly in uh, swimming lessons, he really struggled to hear anything that the instructor was saying. And again, Jess mentions this when you see her video, but again, uh, on sports pitches, in PE, all of that kind of stuff, uh, he would find it very, very difficult to hear. Um, so uh, that's um, that's kind of where he was at during uh, primary school um, and uh, on into secondary school. I think actually as he's got older, things have got easier, partly because he's able to manage the situations better himself and partly because we understand now uh, so much more about how uh, we can support children with high frequency hearing loss. Um, and so I think that has helped me to advocate for him uh, in a in a more kind of comprehensive way. I think back in 2006, uh, we didn't really know that much. Um, but now through the work that um, Pepe has done through these trials for STS, we now realize actually the impact, even, even a, a small amount of hearing loss has on a child. Um, and so I think 
I am better informed and therefore better and more able to advocate for him. Uh, at sec he's at secondary school now. He's in his last year of school, would you believe it? And he is, uh, school, secondary school have been brilliant. Uh, again, we've sat down with them and explained uh, his needs. He sits at the front of the exam hall. Um, I was very concerned that doing his GCSEs, he wouldn't be able to hear the instructions if he was right at the back of the hall. Uh, so they are absolutely brilliant at making sure that he knows exactly when to start the exam and exactly when to stop. Um, and uh, he has he's much more able to advocate for himself now with his friends and with teachers. But again, he's in a small school. Uh, and he uh, is his classes are small and we are very grateful for that because I genuinely think that that has really, really helped him. Um, so that's a little bit about our story. I'm very, very happy to answer questions um, if uh, people have got things that they uh, think would be helpful um, or if there's anything that that you think that, yeah, I could help you with or clarify on our experience. Um, it probably would be good now. Should we play the next video? Um, could we play the primary school video, please? Some cancer treatments can cause different levels of hearing loss. We hope to give you a better understanding of the impact of these on children and some of the ideas for you to help them. When encountering children of primary school age who are dealing with hearing loss, you'll need to be aware of the typical situations they might struggle in. Now please spell ring, sing, king. Make sure that the child knows that it is okay for them to ask for things to be repeated if they didn't hear properly. Just speaking louder does not solve the problem. Thing. Some other problem situations that you should be aware of are playgrounds and sports pitches, hearing instructions in a noisy classroom or hall, and when third party providers are taking clubs or lessons like swimming. A listening buddy that the child has chosen could help in this situation. Try not to separate the two when creating groups or for pair work. If a buddy is not an option, make sure that the child is near the front and can see the teacher. Primary school children will have started to come up with coping strategies, which can include being confrontational or socially isolating themselves. Be considerate of the child and try not to make them feel singled out, but also pay attention if they are lacking in confidence or slow to start tasks because they may not have heard the instructions properly. Great. I think that last point in the video is really clear to mention as well. Um, Peppy and I, when we were discussing these videos, Peppy was very concerned that uh, for a lot of children, they are, con well, there's a danger that they're considered kind of naughty um, because they're not joining in or because they have developed ways of basically retreating, I think, because they can't really engage with what's going on. And so hopefully um, the, the kind of animation in that video shows that the child gets her book out um, because she can't, you know, she's not going to engage, she can't hear anything. And that that's not necessarily a naughty thing, but it may just be a coping strategy that she has, they have developed. Um, so hopefully um, that kind of gives you some idea of some of the uh, ways in which we were kind of approaching, um, particularly that primary school age. Um, I think um, it's probably enough for me. Uh, let's listen to um, Jess and hear her story. Hi, my name is Jess Verdi, mum to Reuben. I won't be able to be there live for the question and answer session, so apologies for that. But I just wanted to talk through our personal experiences with Reuben's hearing loss following his um, treatment for neuroblastoma. 
that he was diagnosed in December of 2016 when he was nearly three and he is now nearly 10 and in year five at school and we are navigating the education system and his progress at school while managing um, his high frequency hearing loss. So in 2017, um, he had the round of chemotherapy that involved the, the drug cisplatin. And we were told before he had that round, like we were every other round, the long list of possible side effects and given all the paperwork to read through and to sign, you know, giving parental consent that, that he could go ahead with that treatment. And as I'm sure my feelings echo everyone else's at that really challenging and difficult time, we were very much focused on the next step. So I think this was round three of um, his induction chemotherapy and um, he had tolerated the first two rounds, but with the, the side effects of, you know, the mucositis, the sickness, the tummy aches, the being admitted to hospital for blood transfusions and platelets. And I think we were just very much focused on getting him to survive the next step um, and being one step closer, if you like, to him being better and the finish line of treatment. And very much in that mindset of we will deal with whatever the future holds as long as he has that future. Very much focused on him surviving those next few days and that next round of treatment rather than looking too far ahead in the future. So when something on the side effects says, you know, possible high frequency hearing loss, that seemed quite minor, to be honest, in terms of all of the other horrendous things that they f they face more immediately. Um, and, you know, the, the most tragic and, and difficult ones to, to read about, you know, the real complications that come with those drugs definitely um, seemed more 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 difficult to get our heads around than than hearing loss at the time that didn't that didn't seem to be too much of a concern it's always seemed to be something that if it happened that was in the future and we would deal with it then so obviously Reuben went ahead and had that treatment and as part of his ongoing like admittance into hospital and then subsequently the follow-up he always had six monthly audiology appointments and at his treatment hospital, um, so he was three at the time, four at the time, he was quite happy to do the tests, you know, the sorting out of the animals, the grouping them into different coloured groups and, you know, listening to the sounds and putting things in in um, the right boxes and things. And it was expressed to us at the time that because he could actually speak and he had quite a big vocabulary by the time he was diagnosed, so he was already three, that actually the impact of um, his hearing loss wasn't wasn't so obvious at the time. And he then, it wasn't mentioned about hearing aids um, or any way to aid his hearing because he was, he was managing, he was coping, he could articulate and speak really well for a three-year-old. So we just continued with the, um, the six monthly um, checkups. I mean, we were given the the graphs, and it it's it shows on the graphs very clearly that at that high level frequency in both ears, he struggles to hear. So at home, I was always testing things like could he hear the beep of the fridge door, and I've left it open too long. Can he hear those things? Um, could he hear me speaking if I was covering my mouth? So I was testing him and um, sort of saying words and saying sounds and there were things that he couldn't hear so he couldn't hear that beep on the um on the fridge door and that sort of thing but we were going along with the advice from the audiologists at that that time that it was very much a sort of let's see how we get on um and he had quite a lot of treatment left to go that was in the, the very early induction stage and obviously to go through then everything else that they 
they go through during the high dose radiotherapy, immunotherapy, um, and then he um, took part in the bivalent vaccine trial in New York. So he completed all of that treatment before we even really um, considered hearing aids because he seemed to be managing absolutely fine. He started school um, and the audiologist did sort of start to say, keep an eye on how he is coping at school and whether he's keeping up, is he hearing instructions? But I think with hearing, it's one of those things that's really difficult, isn't it? Because you, if you haven't heard something, you don't know that you haven't heard it. So he was never going to be able to say, I didn't really hear your instructions or I don't know what to do because I didn't hear because he's oblivious that any of that has even taken place. So school reports and everything always said that he was keeping up. He was um, he was managing to keep up with his peers and we were just so grateful and happy that he was able to be at school to be with his peers and leading you know a relatively normal life um when we spoke to the audiologist about um him ne needing hearing aids it was always expressed to us that actually it could be detrimental because the hearing aids themselves would block out a certain amount of just normal sound um, so in order to aid the high frequency hearing loss, actually you could then be causing it, causing more problems by him not being able to actually hear than just normal sounds of, you know, peers talking. So we, we just kept an open mind about things and kept a dialogue with, with the school while he was in reception and year one, um, and year two, all the way through infant school and and then took that advice from the audiologist as well, that he was coping okay, he was managing fine, his school reports, nothing ever came up. Um, and then in um, 2021, we were transferred from the treatment hospital to a more local hospital to us. And it was then really, it coincided with him starting junior school at a different school in year three. And the advice from the audiologists at our home hospital um, was to speak to the sensory consortium. So for us, that was the Berkshire Sensory Consortium. And we filled out a referral form that the audiologist gave us um, with the school's help as well, just to get some advice from the sensory consortium in terms of how he is at school, the acoustics in school, how he would manage. And I felt a little bit resistant at first because I felt quite sort of like happy in a way that I thought, oh, maybe he's got away with this. Maybe out of all of the things that he's had to suffer and go through, actually, maybe this bit won't have affected him and he's actually okay. And you just feel relief for them that they can continue to be normal and be like another, any other child at school, not have any sort of point of difference um, to move forward with his life. And so I think I found it a, a bit harder to take that there was then this looming idea of him needing hearing aids and needing support in the classroom and being different, I suppose. Um, so the advice then from the Sensory Consortium, so that was in um, 2021 um, and alongside our then routine appointments with the audiology team, they suggested that he actually try hearing aids and we sort of, because he was happy to do that and he was really on board with giving it a go and we spent a lot of time getting the the molds fitted and him choosing the colors and i think the first ones had liverpool football club on them so he was quite happy about that and he was excited about them and and having that sort of um autonomy over being able to to choose what they looked like really helped and he was on board with with trying them out and seeing if if they made a difference so that's how we we started things in 2021 and actually when then the sensory consortium went to the school and spoke to teachers um and then when he had his hearing aids which is then in 2022 they started to test him in terms of like his vocabulary and his ability to 
to hear in the classroom. And actually what came out of that first report really shocked me. Um, and the first report really identified that there could have been an impact on um, his vocabulary, that he actually relies very heavily on lip reading and he's just got by by being able to see people's faces and lip reading, um, so giving advice about how he needs to see the speaker's face, um, that the hearing aids work best when they're sort of at a distance of 1.5 meters and that there could have been an impact on his acquisition of language up until that point and there could be gaps in his learning so any vocabulary needs to be written on the board and all of the tests that the teacher had the specialized teacher had done with him really revealed that um you know, there there was a significant hearing loss in, in the high frequencies and the impact that that had on him at school was that he was missing hearing like soft phonetic sounds. So the ends of words that were very easily mistaken. So 50 and 15 or thumb, sum and fine and five. So you know, I'm not the specialist, so they are not things that I was thinking to test him on at home. But in a school environment, when it's then very clear that it has an impact on other subjects as well as just, you know, speaking in English, um, it has an impact on everything. It made me realise that this is his biggest challenge, actually, right now, is it's being able to access everything that there is for him at school and knowing that actually up until that point um when probably in younger years at school and the emphasis is on you know the play and the socialization all of that sort of thing he was being able to get by and as he's getting older um and trying to access obviously um deeper understanding of subjects that that he really needs to to be wearing his hearing aids um so in year three we sort of came to a compromise where I said, you've definitely got to wear them in the morning when you're doing your English and maths, and then I'll leave it up to you. Um, and he quite often wants to take them out. Uh, he says that they're not that comfortable. Uh, we have been through a few different um, types of mould to try and make them a bit more comfortable. Um, he doesn't like wearing them when he's doing PE and things like that, because he feels that they might fall out. But actually, when he is outside or when he's doing PE, those are the times when he actually needs them. Um, he will would struggle to hear someone's voice. Um, so I've learned, um, you know, when he's outside or the teacher's <clears throat> quite far away. And also if there's, you know, background noise from the road, if there's a whistle that's a certain pitch that he can't hear, he is going to struggle in those situations. So we're trying to strike a balance at the moment of him having some control over when he wears them, but also um, <clears throat> recognising the benefits to him of, of wearing them in these different situations. Um, when the teacher um, came in this year, so we're sort of like 18 months down the line now of him wearing them more frequently, um, the test that she has done this year um, actually showed that with his hearing aids being worn he can still only access 73 percent of um the vocabulary the the words that are being used by the teacher in the classroom if there's other noise going on he can only access you know sort of three quarters of what's happening and that really shocked me because i thought that's even with his hearing aids in so the advice um and the partnership between the sensory consortium and all of their expertise and the school and then us as parents i've i've grown to see it a bit more as you know just really really valuable support um and you know i i think i've learned to grow up a little bit and and look at it slightly differently because ruben just looks at it that way he's like yeah i'll wear them that's fine he's got no issue about wearing them at all and is happy to do so and it was it was definitely me and me thinking, oh, this is just another thing that is a reminder of what he's been through and the suffering and the long-term side effects. But to him, 
it's just the same as wearing his glasses it's it, it really it doesn't bother him at all i'm aware that they that might change as he gets older and perhaps a bit more self-conscious but trying to deal with things as they are as they are right now and, and he's managing them brilliantly um it's just very clear to me that it has such a huge impact on him and his school life and the choices that we make moving forward in terms of you know his next school his senior school and he won't be able to access things unless the teachers are guided in a certain way of how to you know really accommodate his needs um and there has been so much helpful advice that they have given um uh, his teachers and they've actually even run sessions on their inset day to just you know really make it clear about how important it is that you know different teachers coming in to teach them know about his hearing loss know about where he should be sat in the classroom the things to avoid like you know the open window or a really noisy disruptive pupil <clears throat> you know where possible trying to um, make sure that he can access everything that is going on at school when they're doing group work he had a really difficult um time when they were doing a music lesson which i'm sure was really difficult for the teacher as well 30 kids banging away at their instruments but he found that so overwhelming and actually had to just take himself away from that lesson but it's not about him just being put in a quiet room while something else you know like music goes on it's about how to help him be included within those lessons but making um small adjustments like having a you know a small group that he's in go and work somewhere else um and i think it's just about working together and getting that support so as i say that support from the sensory consortium has been absolutely invaluable and just making sure that the the school know how significant an impact it can have i think even ruben is proof of you know he was older he was three he had like with hindsight he was you know my first child so i didn't really know but with with hindsight <coughs> he could actually speak very well and had a really good vocabulary um but even so it's had an impact on the words he th thinks he's learned the words that he thinks are being used um across all areas of the curriculum so i think with without the support from the sensory consortium i would have just taken the, the school's you know feedback that he's getting on well he's you know works hard he's quiet he gets on with things um and as as i said earlier hearing is such a thing that you don't know if you're missing out because you can't hear um so you know other useful advice about teachers sort of checking in or someone checking in on him like throughout the lesson just to make sure that he is on track and he has heard exactly what he's meant to be doing um and his school have been incredible at supporting him and putting putting those things in place and i guess it's just about continue to communicate those needs to other teachers that he will encounter throughout school um, I hope some of that's been useful. As I say, it's just an oh, anecdotal experience. Um, but yes, um, take care, everyone. Bye. Isn't that great? So much of that resonated with me. I think Jess is uh, brilliant at articulating uh, some of the issues that she's currently facing. Um, her situation is slightly different from Ollie's. Um, her son obviously was that bit older, um, but it's interesting how, how similar our experiences are. And I'm delighted that there is something called a sensory consortium that has clearly helped her. Um, and um, yeah, it's good to know about these things, isn't it? Because we don't always know what's out there or what's on offer. Um, we're going to watch the last video now. This is the secondary school video, um, which you might find helpful as you think about your child uh, going on to different stages of education. Please, could we play the secondary school video? Thank you. Some cancer treatments can cause different levels of hearing loss. We hope to give you a better understanding of the impact of these on children and some of the ideas for you to help them. Pupils of secondary school age who are dealing with hearing loss will know in which situations they find it difficult to hear. They will have developed coping strategies and will want to be in control of who knows about their medical history. They should be consulted about any management strategies. 
consider that the student might not want to be singled out. And with that in mind, you may have to sit them at the front of the class or exam hall to hear instructions and check they've understood. Be aware that if they zone out or become frustrated in lessons or group work, it may be because they are finding background noise overwhelming and exhausting. The student might have a friend who is aware of their needs and can help them feel included. They could encourage the others to speak one at a time and to face the students during conversations, not covering their mouths and any secrets could be written instead of whispered. Saying, I can't hear you gets awkward, but just speaking louder doesn't solve the problem. Great. Well, hopefully uh, you found some of our kind of anecdotal evidence helpful. And um, I'm sure that those videos will be available. I have no idea how that will happen. But the, the people, the techie people behind the scenes, I'm sure will make those available. Um, we would love for you to use them. We've created them for parents, uh, for parents all over the world to use them. They are all they have been translated into European languages. So we have uh, videos in nearly every European language, I think. Um, uh, so yeah, I, I, we hope that it will it will be of benefit to you all. Um, back to Pepe. Thank you so much, Billy. Thank you, Jess. Thank you, Christy. Um, can we have Christy back as well? Oh, great, that's wonderful. So I think we are now going to have a Q&A session um, I'm going to try and look at the chat. Oops. So, do you would you like me to ask the questions, Peppy? Would that help? That would be really great because I can't even see them. Okay, I can see them on the side of my computer. Why don't I ask you oh. them? Because they're mostly for you guys anyway. Because you okay. know you know what you're talking about. <laughs> Um, okay. So the first the first question that came in, they were coming in as you were talking, so it was great. Um, the first question was, what indicators can parents look for uh, for potential high frequency hearing loss in their young child? Christy, that's for you. I would say um, a look of confusion or not responding. I think sometimes when, um, especially when children are really young, we might say something or ask something, and then if they don't respond, we may think, oh, maybe they don't want to do it, or they weren't paying attention, or um, there's a lot of things that we can tell ourselves. But I think really important to, you know, check in with your child, you know, what did you hear? What Did you hear what I said? Or can you tell me what you just heard? Just to see, is it is it understanding? Is it that they're just mishearing some of the information? So that's one thing. And I think also, um, just kind of, I think sometimes when there's a lot of noise or people talking at once, children can kind of look overwhelmed and withdraw from that type of a situation. And that may just be another um, indication that they're having a hard time understanding it's too hard and they're going to kind of withdraw and um, not participate as much as they would otherwise. I said so we certainly had anecdotal evidence from from Ollie's teacher when he was in reception, when he was first at school, that, that the playground was overwhelming for him and he would retreat to stand near her um and i'm and and he's a very sociable boy but i'm sure it was because looking back on it now i'm sure it was because noise wise sensory wise it was it was overwhelming for him awesome uh can i ask what level of hearing loss would you rec uh, at what level of hearing loss would you recommend hearing aids my daughter was uh, my daughter has hearing loss at 6,000, is it hertz, and 8,000 hertz. Her graph drops to 40 and 60 decibels at these frequencies. I have always been told that she doesn't need aids for this. Now I'm worried she should have hearing aids. Yeah, so it's such a great question. I think that sounds similar, maybe, Billy, to what Ollie has, at least at kind of a grade one hearing loss at those two highest frequencies. Um, 
I think that it's tricky to fit hearing aids to that really high frequency hearing loss. The benefit of that bandwidth by itself is a little bit limited with the hearing technology we have today and then avoiding um, muffling some of the lower frequency sounds that are also important. So there's kind of a balance with what can the technology do. It's not that the hearing loss isn't important, but the benefit of hearing aids might not be optimal for that type of hearing loss. I would say that um, something to think about is that remote microphone system for noise, especially in the classroom, can be extremely helpful. I think, Philly, you said it beautifully that um, the biggest struggles are that noisy background and distance, and those kind of things are definitely um, will impact the educational environment and having that remote microphone system can be very helpful. And you can, those are even available for other uses, like if a child is doing sports or um, church, you know, things where there's, again, kind of a lots of people, uh, distance kind of situation that that kind of a system can be used. Even for small group work, you can have a little conference microphone that can stream that or can stream to speakers or a receiver that the student wears. Mm. That's super helpful. Yeah. Um, if a child finds too much noise, too much to process, could this be related to audiology? I would say definitely can be related to their hearing. I feel like um, just listening to children as I'm working with them, it's I think sound sensitivity after cisplatin and, and just with hearing loss in general is pretty common where things are just loudness there's kind of less tolerance for loudness overall and especially like lots of noise um really reverberant settings like the swimming pool or um gymnasium kind of thing can just be too much and i wondered maybe peppy and phil you have stuff things that you could add to that as well i, I think you're absolutely right mm -hmm. that um swimming pools even just going into a crowded space it can be really overwhelming mm. dining rooms school dining rooms i think ollie often finds that really difficult um, yeah, and i think it's i think it's the exhaustion as well so i think quite often in social situations at parties now he he will want to leave early and i think a lot mm. of that is to do with the fact that he's tight he's tired because it takes a mm. lot of effort mm. and he's not a, he's not necessarily aware of that that's not necessarily a conscious thing um, but uh, he is often, we were at a wedding recently and he was just like, can, you know, can we go, mum? And I just thought, yeah, actually, you've had enough. And that's that's totally fine. You know, and it's it's hard, isn't it? Because sometimes it can be a personality thing and it's hard to know how much is your child's personality and how much is the audiology. But I think it's always worth having that in the back of your mind so that you don't push them and push them and push them. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, if a child's hearing was checked at the end of treatment, do you recommend any further tests post uh, treatment, i.e. can it decrease over time? It can, and I do recommend that children have regular monitoring after treatment. If at the end of treatment, um, it doesn't appear that there's hearing loss, I would still recommend that, that child have a screening at least um, annually or every two years at least for a while after treatment to make sure that something isn't showing up. Um, if it progresses slowly, that and depending on the age of the child, they may or may not be aware of it or may not report that they're experiencing some differences in how they're able to understand things. So I think that that's really important. If, um, hearing, lo if hearing loss is present at the end of treatment, then absolutely should have at a minimum annual follow-ups, ideally every six months. And if they're wearing hearing technology, every six months is really important to maintain that equipment, make sure that it's adjusted as the child grows, upgraded as needed. Um, also provides you with the ability to learn about things like the sensory consortium, um, what other systems and community resources, educational resources are available, and kind of check in about how that child's progressing because they, I think um, Jess may have mentioned that in those early years, things look pretty good, but then as you get going through school and the learning demands increase, um, especially if you have different teachers, let's say, if you're going into those later school grades and lots of different courses, um, all of that is a factor. And the listening fatigue, like you mentioned, is, is absolutely true, even with hearing technology. It's not that they, they absolutely improve and, and mitigate some of the negative impacts of the hearing loss, but they don't restore normal hearing. Mm -hmm. So you still have a, a 
uh, inner ear system that can't exactly process differences between sounds. So hearing aids restore volume, which is really helpful, but some of those sound distinct distinctions are not gonna be as crisp in that system because of the, the change caused by the medication. So children are, have, are doing extra work to comprehend all day long and that gets really tiring. Mm. You notice in the videos, we, we constantly repeated that that speaking louder doesn't doesn't help because I think a lot of teachers just assume that if children have hearing loss, then they just need to speak louder. And actually, in these kind of instances, speaking louder doesn't necessarily help. Definitely. And our high frequency speech sounds are not voiced, so we can't. I mean, in isolation, you can make louder than <laughs> running speech. You're not going to be able to do that. So you're just increasing the vowels, which is not what what is needed. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, uh, Yes, we've, uh, have we done that one? No, RE minimizing children's exposure to loud environments. Did I hear correctly that further damage could be done? To what extent do we need to be mindful of this? Should certain things be avoided? We have involvement from audiology departments, but they might not have the full understanding of cisplatin. Yes, ab absolutely. Noise um, is a risk factor for anyone, but once you already have hearing loss and then the retention of the platinum in the inner ear that there's, um, you know, each additional exposure can potentially cause changes over time. And so really important to be mindful about um, avoiding noise when possible or using hearing protection. For example, if loud sporting events, um, you know, car shows, power tools, concerts, and not necessarily that somebody should avoid doing things that they enjoy, but we can protect our hearing with earplugs or earmuffs so that it reduces the exposure of sound that reaches the level of our ears. Ollie was really disappointed. I always remember when he was 11 and he was about to go into secondary school, he thought he, was, he could have drum lessons. He was really excited about playing the drums. And <laughs> his audiologist was like, no way. <laughs> you're not playing the drums Ollie so we had to go through all of that but that was I should have managed his expectations a bit better actually see that's the kind of thing that's helpful to know um yeah he was he's not going to be a drummer that's okay that's okay um there are plenty of other things to do do Kirsty and Peppy feel that new technologies are helping to narrow the learning gap in schools now for pupils with hearing loss compared to a few years ago that's for you Christy I absolutely it is um, the improvements in technology have made a, a huge difference and I also the availability is improved I have better access to things better support networks that have been developed I think that um, the importance of hearing on learning is better recognized now than it was even you know 15 years ago so it is um, all of that's making an improvement I think also the emphasis on monitoring hearing children's hearing during treatment has changed over the last 15 to 20 years as well um, you know, I think that that's one of the best changes that has happened for children that require cancer treatment is that just the um, realization and the more information that we have about the risk factors and the importance of hearing and um, why we would want to monitor really to address um, their maintain communication for that child and family. Great. I think that's oh can question question can hearing loss occur after treatment even if at the end of treatment audio tests show no or minimal hearing loss has occurred i think if it's possible and i've seen just a couple of cases where that has been the case um it's less likely but i think important when a child has had that exposure and that risk factor it's you know, the hearing evaluations are I say, it's easy to do. You know, they're, they're you know, not, um, I think it's just really important to get the information. So I think that the, there is a possibility that hearing could change after treatment, even when hearing was normal at the end. So that, yeah, for that reason, I would, I would advocate at least um, regular monitoring for several years after treatment is completed at a minimum. I think this is the last one. but. Oh, sorry, go on, Peppy. Oh, sorry, I just want to say, I think that makes perfect sense because if I understand it, Christy, we tend to monitor hearing up to eight kilohertz, but they could have a deficit at 12 kilohertz, which if you're an English speaker, could have an impact. And as that slowly worsens, it could come into the ordinary audiogram 
in terms of hitting the eight kilohertz, right? You're exactly right. Mm. So yeah, follow up, I think is, yeah, is really important. Mm. Is a remote microphone system designed to be used without hearing aids? It can be used with hearing aids or without. So either one. Um, they even have some receivers that they may look like a little hearing aid, but they don't amplify anything, but they just receive that microphone signal. And they're really open. Um, they're, they don't include the ear canal so that you can still hear things around you, but it does pick up that microphone system. Um, there are also classroom speakers that can be used with that remote microphone technology, and we're probably all familiar with attending a lecture or a, a conference where the speaker uses a microphone system, and that really benefits everybody, including the speaker that doesn't have to raise their voice quite as loud to be heard over the noise level. So all of those options are possible and beneficial. Great. I think that's the last question. Well, I think that's just perfect timing. So um, I'd like to say thank you, Christy. Thank you, Philly. Um, so, so grateful that you were able to give time and come along. Um, and I'd like to thank everybody who's been listening. I mean, we presume somebody's been listening. We don't actually know whether anybody's out there or not. But um, we hope that somebody's listening. Um, and so I think I'm going to, you know, leave it at that and close the session because there are other sessions coming. So um, I think that concludes our um, presentations and our questions. And so what I have to say is really thank everybody. Thank everybody for their questions. So we do know there are people out there because there wouldn't be questions otherwise. Um, we've clearly reached the end of this session. What I have to say is that if you did miss a session or if you want to hear it again, um, it will be available to watch on demand on the event platform. And that there is now going to be a break. So you've got a very short break last time. You'll get a slightly better break this time. And up next after the break, which will be at 10 past six GMT time. So 10 past the hour, wherever you happen to be. Um, there are three sessions to choose from. So on the research track, there will be a session on CAR T cells in the clinic, which you can head over to stream one for on the left hand side of the menu. This is really, really um, sort of top of the range immunotherapy type treatment. Um, it's progressing very rapidly and very exciting for its implications in neuroblastoma. On the supportive care track, there will be a very important session on neuroblastoma has shaped but not defined me, which you can stay here for on stream two. And then something that is very close to my heart, a hope in grief session, which you can head over to the conversation room in the left-hand menu. And we now have in Siopen, so the European Neuroblastoma Group, has a, an outcomes session, an outcomes specialist group, if you like, or committee. And in our last uh, program that we had in Ljubljana last month, we had a wonderful, wonderful session um, from Ana Lacerda, who is actually from, from Portugal, but specializes as a pediatric oncologist in supportive care, palliative care, and has made huge head roads in helping families and people and parents cope with the grief of losing a child. And we know that sadly, particularly in the diagnosis of neuroblastoma, that this is one of the outcomes that might happen. So do go to that session if that really is you. So thank you so much for coming. Thank you for joining. Thank you to um, Solving Kids Cancer for inviting us to come along because I would never have thought of doing a session like this. And the team have been just so encouraging all the way along since we started discussing this as to how we might be able to talk about hearing loss in a useful way. <laughs>